The Nintendo Switch. This is the most recent full-fledged gaming console from Nintendo, and this all gray unit is the one lucky enough to end up on my desk with me. It's time to see what this thing is made of. Let's see if this system will be able to last the next five or six years until the next Nintendo system comes along and takes its place. Let's get started. Now, normally I test cell phones, but this device is meant to be portable, which means it's fair game for my durability tests. I think it's better that I test the durability of a device on purpose, so you won't have to find out on accident. I'll tell you what to avoid and what to watch out for. I always start my durability test with a scratch test on the screen. I use a set of Mohs hardness picks that tell me what the screen is made of. If it's plastic, it'll scratch at a level three. If it's glass, like most cell phones, it'll scratch at a five or a six. But if it's sapphire, like we see on some watches, it'll scratch at a level eight or nine. And if Nintendo made their screen out of diamonds, well, it'll scratch at a level 10. Unfortunately for us though, this switch isn't made out of diamonds. It's actually plastic and it scratches at a level three. Most smartphones have a glass screen because cell phones are designed to be constantly rubbing around in your pocket all the time. I assume Nintendo decided to choose a plastic screen because A, it's cheaper, B, it's not in your pocket all the time, and C, this is a family console, played mostly by kids, and kids at heart, and a plastic screen definitely won't ever get cracked if it's accidentally dropped. Glass would. So it's a valid, cost-effective trade-off, and in this case, I'm okay with plastic. But as you can see from my key marks, it will get scratched up if you just toss it in your backpack or purse. So a screen protector or case is definitely a good idea. I'll link some good screen protectors in the video description. On either side of the device, we have what Nintendo is calling the Joy-Con controllers. And we can tell by the sound of my razor blade that these are made out of plastic. The Joy-Con joystick has a super thick rubber coating around the top. With how thick and strong it is, I can tell it'll take years of playing for it to actually wear out with normal use. Even with me deliberately trying to pull off the sliced portion, it was staying attached pretty well. So far, so good. Here is something I thought was really cool. The top buttons are made of plastic as well, but if you look close, you can see that the letters on these buttons are not printed or screened into place. They are literally injected all the way through the button. So for you diehard gamers out there that have had letters rub off on your keyboard or joysticks with time, that will literally never happen on this Nintendo Switch because the letters are the button. Thumbs up for that. Along the top of the switch, near the headphone jack, we still have a solid plastic exterior layer. And even along the back of the device, there is no ear-splitting sound of metal on metal when I carve into the switch body. If you're one of the few who recognize this symbol, leave a comment and tell me where it's from. It has to do with the Force, and I'm not talking Star Wars. There are a pair of symmetrical vents at the bottom of the device, which are probably for the stereo speakers, or heat dissipation. We'll find out for sure when I do my full teardown. The holes are covered by a thin vinyl layer, which is actually surprisingly easy to tear. So if you ever need to clean these out, be very careful. The kickstand is also made from plastic. Its attachment to the Nintendo Switch is pretty weak sauce. My first time opening it up and it popped right off. The good news though is that it pops right back into place very easy over and over again. I did this several times to make sure that it was still solid and it didn't get any weaker with each removal. So it's probably designed this way, but that also makes it easy to lose as well. And well, it covers the SD card slot, so try to keep track of it. It is important. I know a few of you have already thought, well, I'll just cover up all that plastic with a skin. Well, Dbrand, a company that makes protective skins, said that this particular plastic that is being used on the Switch is not compatible with skins. The plastic gets physically destroyed by the skin, which is pretty odd. So you should probably avoid putting a skin on it for now and just use a case or a sheath instead. Now, normally I'm able to tell what kind of display a device has by applying a little bit of heat. An IPS display turns off, AMOLED burns white, but the thick plastic layer over the 720p Nintendo Switch display is super thick and it never let the heat reach the actual display. The exterior plastic did reach its melting point after about 15 seconds though. Link wasn't too happy with me. But everything still functions 100% so far. Even if the screen were to break, it should still be able to output to a TV like any normal console would with this docking station. The dock allows the switch to play on your TV at 1080p, which is a bit higher resolution than the built-in screen. That screen is 720. 
Just slide it in and the USB-C allows it to dock immediately. There is one large flaw with this dock though, and that's the large plastic runners inside the docking station that press right up against the screen. So every single time you dock your console, the dock will rub up against the sides of your display. Plastic on plastic can still cause damage or scrapes to the screen. And there already has been reports of scratch screens. Luckily, it's not on the visible part of the display, just that thick black bezel between the display and the side controllers. So it's not that big of a deal if it does get scratched. But once again, a thin screen protector would solve this issue 100%. I would say a screen protector is pretty mandatory on this console. Remember, I'll have some linked in the video description. As you know, the Switch is pretty modular. You can play with little joystick niblets attached to the screen like you've seen me doing, or you can pull them off and play with them detached. The third way you can use them is to attach them to this little grip. That turns both niblets into one large handheld controller. The new symbol I just drew is a bit more difficult, so let me know in the comments if you know where this one's from. Muggles probably won't understand. After joining the Joy-Con controllers into the Joy-Con grip, I can give it the initial stress test. A basic flex in all directions reveals that it's pretty darn sturdy for being a bunch of plastic parts stuck together with little thin rails. I don't see any immediate failure points on this controller unless you are intentionally trying to break it. Everything is still totally functional so far. One interesting thing about the controllers is the little LED light built on the inside. When you slide the controller into the grip, it transfers the light upward, shining out of the grip itself. This is done with little tiny mirrors inside of the controller handle. You can see what I mean when I shine the LED flash from my phone into the mirrors. It still transfers the light straight up and out of the grip. Interesting stuff. We saw the same feature in the GoPro 5 when I tore that down. Now the rail on this Joy-Con controller is made out of plastic, which at first I thought was a bad design. But it turns out the plastic Joy-Con rail isn't the failure point. The connecting rail on the console itself is made out of metal, which is rather refreshing when dealing with a console entirely made out of plastic. I do love how securely and satisfyingly these controllers click into place. Now it's time to find the failure point. Trying to bend the body of the console was futile. There was no breakage no matter which way I was bending from. The center body and the screen are very strong. Even the side Joy-Con controllers are pretty strong by themselves. It would be very difficult to break one of these off on accident. But with enough deliberate force, I was able to snap off one side. The interesting part though was that the failure point wasn't the plastic rail or the metal rail. I'll show you what broke in a second. The important thing is, is that the console is still working completely, which is good, obviously. The part that broke were the four screws holding the metal rail into the switch body. The rail itself is fine, the screws are fine, but the inferior metal holding the screws to the body of the switch ripped right out. Definitely not what I was expecting to happen. I'm pretty sure that the wire at the bottom of this rail is what charges the Joy-Con, so the side rail definitely is important. Luckily mine is still connected and that wire didn't rip. For the most part, I would classify this portable console as durable. Even though I was able to deliberately break mine, you shouldn't have any issues with yours unless you're dropping it off your house or someone extremely heavy sits on it. But as long as you get a screen protector for that screen, the rest of the console should survive just fine. I can say the Nintendo Switch is definitely a successful successor to the Wii U. My Twitter followers knew this video was coming before anyone else, so make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram to stay up to date on my future projects. Thanks for watching. I'll see you around.